Welcome back, and we did finally connect with uh, Jonathan Gray. Um, Jonathan, you, you get a chance to, to have a, I call the the, uh, the bird sight perch sitting in New Zealand and with the vast amount of knowledge you have of the books you've written in BeforeUs.com and <clears throat> biblical knowledge, but knowledge that goes beyond that to the knowledge of the gospel and the stars, a deeper understanding of the ancient peoples in the world, cataclysms that have happened to our planet, um, which you've written many, many books on, which I tell people this is going to require reading if you want to broaden your experience and understanding of the nature of our world and our creator God and the necessity of man to have a relationship with the creator or there will be no sustainable civilization. And right now, uh, the situation going back between the West and Russia is deteriorating daily. Uh, they're now calling for their own credit card system. They're trying to destroy the petrodollar. Russia is basically saying they're going to deploy nuclear missiles and military in our sphere of influence just south of the United States and in uh, Nicaragua, Cuba, and uh, in Venezuela, which, of course, we're trying to regime change there to an orange revolution. Uh, all of this is very biblical. And, of course, the half of the Russian army are Muslim, uh, mostly... Uh, the kind of Muslims that are allied with Iran. And if you look at the table of nations listed in Ezekiel 38:39, 39, uh, the statement 38:39 starts with the scriptures, O Gog, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh. And if you actually look at it in the Hebrew, which is what it was originally written in, uh, they're, re- they're really saying the grandson of Noah, uh, which is a Meshach, Tubal, which is Moscow and Tobolsk of Rosh, or Russia. Uh, and be thou an armor and a guard, meaning to arm all the surrounding nations, including the Muslim nations that are listed there, and uh, the kings of the east. So, I mean, everything is lined up to to a disaster that's coming, and we can avoid it if we repent, but I don't see a lot of repentance, and it has to start with the church. The church basically, by and large, is what I call milk and cookies. They don't want to get into prophecy. They want to say that they're just a welcoming committee. They don't realize you don't welcome... You're not welcomed into the kingdom until you actually take up your scepter and start taking responsibility for our messed up world. And uh, you have to, to use the intellectual power you have to actually show books that teach people that we do have responsibility. You know, People aren't even going to recognize the Messiah when he returns until the Messiah rises in their hearts and they take up their scepter and start being sons and daughters of the Most High and actually changing our world. And the most important thing is to seek the truth and to seek God in everything. So... Um, with that opening, tell us what kind of issues you see kind of on the horizon this year and next, because we have the blood moons. The first one starts literally in two weeks, roughly, April 15th, uh, and culminates in a blood moon on uh, September 28th, 2015, which is uh, a date that's the literally last day of the Shemitah year, right before a time which is going to be a seven-year period of tribulation. And uh, I don't know if it's the tribulation, but I can tell you the time of, of sorrows is here with extreme weather, famine, uh, economic chaos, about to crash, uh, a dialectic that's gaining momentum in terms of literally lining up the forces for World War III. And at any moment, things could go wrong. Russia could just decide to do a preemptive strike and, and, and be off with the West because they're so fed up with the misbehavior of the United States, Europe, and the international bankers. Um, so uh, what, what do you think of what's going on, and how do you tie it into the Bible and all the vast array of books you've written? Well, Dr. Bill, uh, it's all happening, and uh, it's about to, the biggest is about to happen. Right. Uh, I would not like to be living in the Middle East right now because uh, if I if I had children growing up there, I'd want to whisk them off to some place which is a little bit safer. Yeah, I think the Middle East is, at the very minimum, we're going to have a regional, very ugly war here very soon, and it also means that there's going to be enough death and destruction that frightens the world into literally accepting a peace treaty which we know is going to partition the state of Israel, set up a Palestinian state, and uh, guarantee that there will be only a period of false peace for three and a half years, roughly, by Hebrew years, 1,260 days, and then Armageddon will break out. And we know that the peace treaty has to be sanctified on the Hebrew temple on Sakat, so it means that literally the middle of the tribulation is actually on Passover, the same day that our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach died on the cross for us. So, you know, God is playing all these things out beyond time and space to prove to you and to everyone out there that man is incapable of good unless he hears and does God's will, whether he's a politician, a scientist, a teacher, a bus driver, a welder. It doesn't matter who we are. Without God, we are malevolently incapable of doing good. Absolutely, yes. Uh, there are too many people today. I'm, I'm meeting them all the time. 
who say we can solve our own problems. We don't need God. We, uh, we have the capacity to be gods ourselves and, and uh, we don't need an outside power to come in and help us. Well, yeah. uh, well my friend, uh, you've got to think again. There's no yeah. way we can get out of our mess. We right. have got ourselves into the mess and we're too deeply down in, in the pit. We need someone to reach down and help us. Well, I think mankind has, has got the idea now, and you see it with Ray Kurzweil, who's now the director of new research at Google, that the transhumanism is only a matter of decades away, where man will fuse with technology and become a demigod and literally emerge with technology and nanotechnology so that mankind will control his genetics and literally uh, reach, what I call the Wright Brothers, terminal velocity where mankind won't die. And I think that people don't understand that the death is not just the death of the physical body because just copy, making a real good copy of mind or the connectome of our brain and our experiences is not us. We're a spiritual being that's connected to a physical fleshly body. But the fact is we, our essence, is soul. And it's connected to a body that will die. And the soul will die too if it doesn't fuse with the Creator God and become an eternal being. And people don't get that. And the church doesn't teach that. They don't teach that faith is never blind. The truth is never blind. That God is prescient in everything, and he's the source of all good, all knowledge, all wisdom, and all love. Not just some, so an alternative that's satanic gets put out there on the shelf, and people think, well, we can solve this. No, you can't. That's when we get leaders that are communist, uh, fascists like Obama, or we get leaders that are neo-Nazis, what I call neo-Nazis, like George Bush and George Bush Sr. None of these fools can actually solve it because they believe in the satanic idea that they rule by a god of forces. They are going to force their ideas and others. They're going to lie to people. They're going to poison them so they can't even think straight with fluoridated water and GMO foods and aspartame, etc. So they turn them into biological zombies where their soul is cut off from their physical body. Uh, and they, they put forward systems that they try to pretend are health care, like Obamacare, which isn't even socialized health care like in New Zealand or Canada. These systems are designed to kill people. They're designed to terminate people. They're designed to take away all autonomy of the population. And I, I'm just amazed that people think that there's room to argue about this stuff when it's right in front of them. It's almost like arguing that a lion is about to eat you alive, and the lion you can hear growling, and they're four feet from your face. It's, it's bizarre. It's, I call it vicious ignorance, where people are really snapping, angry, and, and doing ad hominem attacks when, in fact, we're like firemen trying to pull them out of a burning building of a falling civilization, and they don't believe it. They don't believe it. They don't believe that we're literally moments away from annihilation as a civilization. They don't believe it. It's weird. It's like the curse of Cassandra, where somehow, uh, you know, in the ancient, uh, this is the ancient story, and you know it, where Cassandra was always correct, but no one ever believed her until after the event happened. And then they would always promise that they would believe the next time she... You know, she, she would give them a, a warning, and they never heeded it. It's amazing. When we come back, we'll hear a lot more from Jonathan about where we're going and what we're doing for our personal health, our geopolitical health, our financial health. Welcome back, and um, just going back to this report that I have here of Small nuclear war would destroy the world. This report came out of Denver, out of CBS 4 channel, and it says, estimated 17,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Only a small conflict with, say, Pakistan, India and Pakistan could spark a global environmental catastrophe. And the researchers, this is a new study, by the way, did a computer model of the Earth's atmosphere and ran simulations to find out what would happen if there was a nuclear war with just a fraction of the world's arsenal. And then what they saw was the stuff of nightmares. Firestorms would uh, belch over 5 million tons of ash into the sky. The ash would absorb the sun's rays, causing deadly cooling of the surface. Uh, global temperatures would plummet by nearly 3 degrees Fahrenheit on average, with most of the northern hemisphere experiencing winters that would be colder by 4 to 10 degrees. Lethal frost would cover the earth and reduce the growing seasons by almost a month for several years. Rainfall and other precipitation would be reduced to about, by about 10 percent, <clears throat> triggering worldwide drought and leaving wildfires in the Amazon, which would spew more, more smoke. And the sky and uh, ash would heat the atmosphere and accelerate the chemical reactions that destroy the ozone layer. And of course, it also means it would destroy the benthic layer of the oceans, so that there would be no more phytoplankton to make 80 percent of the world's oxygen. So the world's oxygen level would literally drop. So if you didn't live in a domed city that concentrated oxygen, you'd die. Uh, we know that at the time of the dinosaurs, for example, that the dinosaurs existed at a time where 
the concentration of the Earth uh, before the Andaluvian fall was 35 to 40 percent in two atmospheres at sea level. Uh, after the destruction uh, that occurred, the oxygen concentration fell dramatically, and that means many life forms, including us, would not be able to exist outside. This is just one example of based on a computer model, and it's probably got enough parameters that it's you know scary enough, but it's true that we cannot survive war in the future. And what God is saying is that lest those days be cut short, no flesh would survive. He has sent witnesses, us, Jonathan Gray, myself, and others, before the people to tell the truth. And then you need to go outside and pray. And you can do something about it. It doesn't matter if you're a housewife or if you're a welder or you're a doctor or whatever. The first thing you need to do is seek God and then intellectually analyze this. Don't be busy uh, about cursing those who bring the truth because, in fact, the most vile sin you can commit is not mass murder or even abortion. It's to attack the messengers that bring the truth to you about the, the pathway to salvation. There is nothing more vile in God's kingdom as a sin than attacking those who bring the truth to you. Nothing, including mass murder and even abortion. That's how bad this is, because when you do that, you cut off your ability to have the Holy Spirit indwell in you and teach you that you are a son or daughter of the Most High, that your spirit, your soul is a non-physical portion. You're not a biological machine or an advanced animal or highly evolved slime. Which, of course, the globalists and the latest movie Cosmos tries to teach you with Neil deGrasse uh, Tyson, who's another we call science idiot, arrogant. And these people basically think that they are, in a sense, the purveyors of all truths because they can understand a few equations like Newtonian physics or Principia Mathematica and, and whatever. And really what they do is they, don't under, they only understand a tiny sliver of the nature of reality and can not include God in the equations of whether or not God recreates organisms even after Chernobyl or how mankind even exists. So these fools pretend to be wise and try to browbeat and bully other people into, the, into what they think is the truth. And they therefore bolster up their own system of logic and narcissism based on beating up on other people rather than releasing them with the real truth and real questions that don't assault their intellect. So I'm very distressed by programs like, like Cosmos and by media channels like PBS that push forward, I call lies that exclude God from the equation of reality. Your comments? Yes, absolutely right. Uh, and uh, we, uh, those who are doing these things uh, think that they're on the right because uh, when a person is uh, doing wrong, he convinces himself that he's doing right and that it's for everybody's <laughs> good, including his own good. The mind yeah, is really... totally messed up without God. Yeah, and the thing is when you start to actually very calmly and deflecting like a martial artist all the ad hominem attacks, as they say on the program, if you think you know better than Dr. Deagle or my guests, we have the nerve to list your questions specifically, not just go on and blather or do it how no attacks, but list your specific questions or statements to the board operator. That's 800-259-5791. And we're going to have an intellectual vivisection. We're going to take you apart intellectually on the air. And it doesn't matter if you're a pastor, a scientist, an MD, a so-called biblical expert. And there's a lot of these megachurches to me that are clearly, without virtually any exception, they're all basically giving just what I call the milk and cookies portion of the gospel. They're not really telling the truth that empowers people. And so most people don't even understand. They know about Jesus, but they don't know how to follow him. They don't know the power of literally having the Spirit of God indwell in them and actually directing every action of the day. They don't know that. So basically we have a bunch of sheep ready to be eaten by the wolves, and the wolves are ready to crash the economy, destroy the environment, and start World War III. And they don't believe us. They think that we're just conspiracy theorists, that Satanists and Masons are running the world. They don't believe this. Even though the evidence is right in front of them with documents, you can give them mountains of documents. You can mount all the way to the moon. They don't believe it. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Well, as Jesus said, even though when raised from the dead, they won't believe. <clears throat> right, right. And, of course, and since I'm Lazarus, I was died at birth, pronounced dead. DOA, footling breach, pronounced dead at birth. 26 minutes, and then dead at eight and a half with a French surgeon did an operation on my neck, my tonsils, bled to death. And I'm Lazarus. I've come back from the dead, sent back specifically to tell people, as a physician, as a scientist, as a person who literally has had first-hand experience with God, and tell them, look, uh, God's not a respecter of persons. I'm not better than anybody else. In fact, with my talents, it probably would have been much worse because I could have done a lot more devilish things. 
Well, what people need to know is that the blood of Jesus saves us, but then we join our blood because our experience, our daily activities, everything that we do is our blood. So our blood joins the blood of this Yeshua HaMashiach, and we become a bondservant to God. We become a true son or daughter. We are no longer a victim. We are now a, a literally a representative of the signet ring of the Creator, and we have the right and authority to change reality in the timeline. We are not victims anymore. And people need to get that. They need to stop taking the victim approach, whether you've got cancer or financial problems. God always has a solution, whether it's Fukushima, Daiichi, or the economic chaos that's coming, the devaluation of the dollar, which is almost certainly going to happen this year, the movement toward the mark of the beast. All of these things are like we're linemen on the rail line, ready to pull a switch, but we need prayer to have the strength to pull that switch to switch the train. And people still, they don't believe us. And you can hear the train going bomb, bomb, and the light coming around the corner, and they say, my gosh, we only have moments left to pull the lever, and people aren't praying for us to have the strength to pull the lever. That's what's so distressing about this, because the consequences are not just physical death. It's not just omnicide of every living thing on the planet. It's the death of the souls of millions and millions, billions of human beings living, literally living in the spiritual womb called the little, I call the, the little sapphire star in the swinging in the universe called little blue planet Earth, the womb of God's children. And that's what's so distressing is that people don't believe this. And it's yes. right in front of them. Bill, I, I think there's a factor here that most people are forgetting, and that is we're caught in a cosmic war. Yes. Uh, this world was made beautiful in the beginning. There was no suffering, and it changed when Satan's mob dropped in. And, and as, as we've seen in past uh, times, we're caught in a conflict between the forces of good and those of, of this Lucifer legion. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Satan's exactly. trying to get revenge on Yeshua for what happened in heaven when he was thrown out. Right. Now, uh, I don't understand the first heaven, which is the... why we've descended into such a mess. Yeah. Exactly, it's true yeah. that we're responsible for our own actions, but we need to lift our eyes to see that bigger and more sinister play that's going on behind the scenes, which is super energied by evil forces. Uh, there can be no doubt that these forces have permeated politics, religion, science, the media, education, business, and so on. So it's time we face the truth, however startling that is. Yeah, and it's startling to see a conspiracy this vast. This organized, this super intelligent. Remember, Satan was the most brilliant created being in the universe, and he rebelled against the Creator God. And his first statement, I'm sure, to God in heaven was, Hey God, I got this. Welcome back, and uh, Jonathan, you've written an amazing array of books. One of the latest ones that we talked about last year before we had our communication problems uh, was, I think, The Forbidden Secret. The Forbidden Secret. Secret. Uh, yeah, this, this, this book is having repercussions through the prisons here in New Zealand. Uh, uh -huh. Gang leaders are coming to the Lord. Uh, uh, yet prisoners are being let out before time because of, of their exemplary behavior after they've given their hearts to the Lord. Uh, I did not realize how much uh, the message in this book was going to shape pr the prison system over here. Yeah, exactly. And, and, how, and what happened? Well, well, uh, it, 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 the message is powerful because it's, it's focused on Jesus, who has all power given to him. Uh, he, he, can, he can snatch people from demonic possession or from uh, so-called alien abductions, and he's doing it all the time. He's doing it every day around the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, well, anyway... The, so that's important, and of course, in the... In the uh, in the environment of prisons, a lot of people get converted. Unfortunately, a lot of them here in America get converted to Islam, and they start the, the, the horrible fighting pathway of becoming an Islamic militant. And, of course, I think the prison systems can literally encourage that because they consider this idea the idea of religious pluralism. And to be honest with you, I don't think that, uh, that Islam should be legally allowed in America. Uh, you know, freedom of religion is religion, but the system of Islam is nine-tenths uh, political, geopolitical, uh, uh, if you want to call it invading cancer, and only a time one tenth of it actually has any religious connotations whatsoever. So it's not typically, if you want to call it a religion. Just as, a, for example, a cult should not be considered a religion that decides that killing cats at midnight on a full moon is a religion. It's not. It's a cult. And uh, our problem with North America is this pl religious pluralism 
is just a uh, poisoning our culture. The same way as this idea everybody has rights. Well, how about if people have wrongs? Uh, when you give so-called rights to marriage to people who could never have biological children except in the laboratory that are of the same sex, you can't call it marriage when it's not a man and a woman. Uh, that's just not rational. You can call it a union. You can share insurance. Or you can share benefits or, or property, but you can't call it a marriage. The state has taken over something that is purely spiritual and has nothing to do with the state. And this is an example of the lack of logic that's going on through our entire culture, that we now have activist judges appointed by satanic leaders like Obama, uh, Sotomayor and uh, Kagan, who with uh, the recent decision over Hobby Lobby, basically say, well, even though you're a Christian organization and you want to give health insurance to your um, your staff of all your different uh, divisions of the store, uh, the option we're going to give you is that you have to stop trying to give health care insurance and pay the tax because it's a tax now, by the way, which is being forced on you, which is illegal also. And now you have to actually tell the staff they can decide what insurance they want, including insurance that provides for abortion. So these are evil, satanic, and sabotaging Satanistic women who should never have been in a position where their religion, which is Satanism, allowed to be called a purveyor of keeper of Christian values as a purveyor of the Supreme Court to maintain a Christian nation which is free of satanic influence. And that's not rational. So we're under a cloud of horrifying judgment that's coming, and it's going to come real quick. Uh, we have a caller, uh, Mark in Oregon, and he had a couple of statements. Uh, uh, talked about seven years of tribulation, wanted to know about possible spiritual ramifications for the seven years. Uh, Mark, you want to just frame that a little bit more clearly for uh, Jonathan? Yes, good, good day, gentlemen. Good day to you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. It's uh, very excellent. Um, Dr. Bill, you've uh, been a benefit to me in various ways since I started listening to your show a good while back. And one thing more recently that uh, I think you've answered for me that I've been wondering about for years and even uh, made a wrong assumption about where we're at in that seven years of tribulation, of which the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years. I was never sure if we were already in it. No, we hadn't reached it's, it's, the Great Tribulation yet. We're still in the first three and a half years, and I think you've clarified for me that... Yeah, I'll, I'll make it actual... real plain for those who haven't heard it before. So just real, this is real straight. It wasn't clay and iron. I received the book supernaturally in 1988, released it 11 years later in 1999 with the Prophecy Club to 42 cities in Israel. And Jonathan and any Hebrew scholar, including the so-called uh, people in Zafed, which are the Hebrew scholars of the current reconstituted Sanhedrin, believing the ancient uh, Torah rules of how to set up, quote, the sacrifice would actually technically and scientifically and scholarly uh, agree with this. Number one, the tribulation can only start when they sanctify the Temple Mount. It can only be done in one day. And that day has to be Sakat. It has to be after a Shemitah year, which means it has to be after seven years. It has to be in a Shemitah year. That first day after the Shemitah year is, is September 28, 2015, period. Number two, the tribulation, which is false to a period of peace for three and a half years, will be broken 30 days before on Yom Kippur, where the sacrifice is stopped. And 30 days later, the great tribulation, which is a horror, starts with a great war. And the first five months of that war is where all the crops are turned white because the ozone layer disappears, because great destruction comes upon the planet, a massive famine, and then eventually a thermonuclear, biological, and chemical war that God cut short so flesh would survive. That time is coming. Uh, I believe that we're probably within, and I'm not going to set dates, but I think we're probably within a year or two of the tribulation starting after a peace treaty, because there isn't a peace treaty, there's going to be a really big war here in the Middle East. Israel would pull back all of its embassies, and it's not because of a dispute over finances, because they're getting ready to do an attack on Iran, and the only way they can get do that is if they got our bunker buster nukes that could get down deep into Qum, or the facilities that have the high-speed centrifuges, and to these so-called false silos all over the country, and it's a giant country that's a third of the size of the continental United States, My half of it's mountainous, impossible to invade, it's ridiculous. And uh, yet, we are supporting Israel that's going to do an attack on the live nuclear reactor at uh, Bashir, which is populated by at least 700 plus Russian scientists that have one of the largest active nuclear reactors on the planet. And yet they're going to hit the live reactor and break its reactor core and spew out radiation, which we know from the society of what we call 
the Physicians for Social Responsibility, which I belong to for over 40 years, that when this happens, the radiation going over uh, China, going over Myanmar, which used to be called Burma, uh, going over most of the populated super industrial areas of China, South Korea, all the way to Japan, will kill millions and make devastation to these countries and basically human reproduction impossible. And yet this is something that they're, they're literally contemplating this year, possibly within months. And we're doing nothing. On the one hand, we're trying to pretend that we're not going to support Israel, but we give them all the equipment, including the tanker bombers, to do it. So uh, Mr. Putin's making every move four and five steps ahead of America, including deploying nuclear missiles, in which they have portable ones, in these other countries. And if we start to do an attack, our cities will go on fire within 7 to 12 minutes. Not 20 to 40 minutes, 7 to 12 minutes, because they have nuclear subs off either coast right now. One popped up in the Gulf of Mexico last summer. People need to realize we are seconds away from Armageddon. That's how bad it is. And it won't start on God's calendar until the peace treaty is signed, and thereafter on Sakat. They start the blood sacrifice, and the Kalal, the ashes of the red heifer, and the Kohanim start the procedure. And they can do it with a simple tent of meeting, the tent of meeting of Moses that was in the desert, and start building the, the so-called the cornerstone, which they've already been dragging for years, down to the Temple Mount. Last fall, they actually had the certification by the Israeli government to build a temple now. So we're there. This is no longer something that can just be speculation or the vain imaginings of Deagle or anybody else. All of the signs that the Bible is lined up are precisely lined up to tell us we, are, we can hear the breath of the dragon and the smell of smoke and sulfur. We can see the ashes of the war rising already. We can see the flash coming. We can see the destruction of our dollar happening as we aggravate and create more circumstances to guarantee that our next move after they crash the dollar is literally America forcing the world to accept an authentication financial system where all their other means of exchange is illegal. And it's in Patriot Act 1 and 2. So this is not open to dispute. So people want to dispute with Dr. Deagle? I will beat you up so thoroughly and vivisect you so thoroughly because it's so desperately late in the hour. I'm like a fireman with my Scott Air Pack and my uh, mask on and my fire equipment to withstand 2,000 to 3,000 degrees. And the victims are trying to pull off my mask so I'll die with them as I pull them out of a burning building called Earth. But it's too late. We're going to go into this because people have not repented, and the churches are the worst. They do not want to accept the truth of what's coming, do they? No. Jonathan, uh, Dr. John. Dr. Bill, I'd like to make a comment here. Yet everything you're saying, we're in a real mess. But here we've got a fellow who wants to help us. Not only that, he's able to help us, and what are we doing about it? This guy called Jesus, who exactly. came down into human history, he has power to give a character change and survival for anyone who will accept his hope. Absolutely. And uh, Johnson will be back on April 6th. Thank you, Jonathan. 